Um, I don't know who that guy was that Paul was talking about. I'd date him. He sounds pretty good. Uh, sadly, you guys are stuck with me for the next between now and drinks, which makes it the longest, <laughs> at least it feels like the longest session of the day. So, look, I'm going to reiterate what Paul said. This has been really lovely today. Thank you all for coming. It's been really nice talking to you. I've learned loads. Thank you to the speakers. I've loved listening to you. I've learned loads. It's been brilliant, right? Thank you very much. It's been great. Now, having said that kind of upbeat stuff, those of you that have been to GraphConnect before and had to suffer this before, you know what's coming, right? That's the kind of like build it up bit. And now it's the kind of cathartic slash dramatic backdrop. So it turns out, right, in all the years I've been coming to GraphConnect, I've had the privilege to, to close out and, you know, uh, have a few giggles and then go for drinks. It always felt, you know, coming here with this accent, and of course my countrymen are like, crap accent, but coming here, it always felt a bit like this. As near as chief scientist, it always felt that this accent kind of gave me a bit of swagger, right? Because I could say things like, and we're going to plumb the flux capacitor into the traversal framework, and we will be traversing at a rate of 1.21 gigawatts. And you guys will be like, oh, that's a trustworthy accent. <laughs> I, I, get, I buy that. Yeah, 1.21 gigawatts of graphs, that's what we need. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, this, and I rode that. I've got to tell you, right, you guys were like, brilliant. And then a little while ago, back in the mother country, like, some crazy stuff started happening. Don't worry, you'll, you'll get your own crazy soon. But some like, crazy stuff started happening. And this doesn't work out brilliantly for me, right? Because now, like, it initially started off with people like, oh, what's that? And then it was kind of like, kindly, oh, that seems a bit bad. And then it was kind of awkward, like, oh, can I catch a Brexit from you? And now I come here, right? And it's not, it's not this anymore. It's not like, hey, I can show it, right? It's like this. People are, like, treating me. Like this, like avoid, avoid Cletus. Of course, those of you from the UK, you know that I've already got a Cletus accent. It's just for a few blessed weeks a year, I'd come here and no one knew. Now I'm rumbled. So this is a problem for me because now this feels like I can't just cruise through this one, uh, depend, you know, kind of basing my uh, uh, talk just on, on, on an accent. It's, it's gone terribly wrong for me. Fortunately, I have this thing in my company that I can rely on called leadership, right? So Emil's like, look, dude, seriously, this is all about the Silicon Valley. <laughs> oh, hi, Emil. <laughs> He's like, look, man, just because in the mother country, like, you've got rampant inequality, rampant stupidity, a prime minister that makes Margaret Thatcher seem progressive and cuddly, get your head in the game, dude. This is all about the Silicon Valley tech. This is all about the Silicon Valley scene. The sophisticated Silicon Valley audience. I live in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. It was a lot of Silicon Valley going on, right? Yeah. Fair play. Game on, dude. Aha! So, yeah. so for, for those of you that haven't been religiously watching Silicon Valley, or as we think of it in the UK, a documentary about the company I work for, this is going to make no sense to you. For those of you that have, look for all the in-jokes. And uh, if any of you know Mark Needham, doesn't he look good with hair? I think he looks... Absolutely, I, I mean myself too, right? But uh, looks great with her. So isn't it time someone put the venture back in venture-backed graph database company? So actually, this is the real title of the keynote, Graph Insanity, where insanity in this context refers to scientifically responsible jubilation. <laughs> so what are we, what are we gonna see? There's only about three of you that actually watched this far through season three. Now that fell so flat. So what are we gonna do? Uh, so, we're going to do a brief recap. I think it's very worth uh, looking at where we've come recently uh, in Neo4j, because uh, it turns out many of you didn't make it over to London. A lot of good stuff happened there. Emil covered some of it in his keynote this morning. I think it's well worth talking about you know, kind of the current trajectory that, that Graph takes on. I think it's pretty cool. I also then want to kind of seg into hardware. Um, hardware got interesting again. I mean, we saw the IBM folks this morning talking about some quite unusual hardware, and it turns out that the hardware folks they haven't just left it all up to us software folks to do fun stuff. They've been innovating as well. I think it's really interesting to cover some of that. And we'll have a look how some of that filters through into kind of native graph tech and the kind of uh, performance advantages that we can get from, from being uh, native graph tech. And then I'm going to look a little bit to the future, see what's coming down the line, see what fun stuff we'll have to play with. And then the important thing, we'll all go and get merrily sloshed in the bar next door. Sound good? Ah, especially the merrily sloshed bit. You're like, hell yeah. Ah. 
booze. So, one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, what have we been doing since we last gathered with Neo4j people at a Neo4j conference to talk about Neo4j things with the Neo4j community and Neo4j engineers about Neo4j and the things you might do in Neo4j in your Neo4j based enterprises, Neo4j? <laughs> Consider the bulldog. Well, we've actually done a lot of very interesting things, right? If you think about what happened in, in 3.0, the kind of uh, personas that were, that were addressed there. And so in 3.0, we made sure that if you're designing uh, graphs, that you didn't have any practical limits on the size of graphs that you could store. So you could store giant graphs and get great performance from them. If you're a developer, uh, we retired that you know, crufty old REST stack that some bozo implemented for his first Neo4j commits and replaced it with a brilliant, this is hurting me, Nigel, brilliant protocol, binary, pro binary protocol, and a wonderful driver stack. So if you're using Neo4j now, the excitement isn't in just getting the bloody thing bound to your client app. The excitement's all in the graph model, right? Doing wonderful things for your business rather than getting all excitable about the plumbing. That stuff has become now de rigueur. It's easy to do. Nigel and his team have made that absolutely seamless. That's fantastic. And if you're administrating this stuff, we've worked really hard to make sure it works very, very flawlessly on-premise, in cloud, in containers, wherever you're trying to deploy it. And I think that was a really worthy thing. You might have missed it because it happened in the old world. All right, so uh, just bringing you up to speed with where we're at now. Now, of course, in 3.1, uh, as we mentioned throughout the day, we've created what we think of as a kind of uh, enterprise-grade graph foundation. So in 3.1, you have the new security stuff, which just makes uh, all of your kind of uh, security architects folks stop worrying. You can become compliant. You can plumb into your standard enterprise security stuff. And we've got the, the clustering stuff, the stuff that my team's worked on. So now you can build very large clusters whilst retaining... Uh, 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 a very, very convenient causal consistency level. In fact, uh, we had uh, a Dr. Diego Angaro in the audience this morning who actually designed the protocol that we subsequently uh, subsumed and built into Neo4j, and he approved, which was like, whew, right? Because it's like a kind of yet another PhD defense, except you're defending his PhD in front of a live audience, and it was a bit stressful. Uh, not for me, because I didn't talk this morning, but for Alistair and Max, it was pretty scary stuff. So we've got this like nice foundation now where we've got effectively these kind of things. So we've got the causal clustering stuff, we've got the security foundation. A bit, a bit low down the stack, our database kernel guys have been plugging away to make this stuff just faster, smoother, better. Up the stack in the front end, you've now got the, uh, the, the, the schema viewer stuff and the UI affordances that are just make the, thing, you know, make the whole stack very pleasant to work with. And then we've got some really interesting stuff, like some kind of you know, slightly left field stuff, working with uh, coprocessor-based uh, a storage to make it uh, kind of fast. So I think this has been like a really interesting, like a three-point X train has so far been really interesting and I think quite, quite compelling. And if you've been with us through the two-point X train, you see this is kind of like, hey, you know, this is a substantial improvement in our maturity. This feels like, you know, you could have bought this from like some legacy relational company. <laughs> Consider the elephant. Legend has it, it has a memory so robust it never forgets. And I think memory has got very interesting in computer systems. I know it's a cheesy seg, isn't it? Something really interesting happened about 2012. Intel, in Intel years, that's about Sandy Bridge. And we didn't notice because we're software guys and we sit 27 levels above this stuff, but something really, really important happened. Anyone know what was the important innovation in Sandy Bridge? No, because we're all software guys, right? Actually, we're just, just, just a machine. Actually, something really important happened. When I were a lad, it was a long time ago now, I always taught, uh, that, I was, I was taught that the way that if I wanted to read a value that another thread or another processor had produced, that value must be put in memory. And when it's in main memory, then my thread can read it. And that was a common architecture for symmetric multiprocessors back when I did my PhD, which seemed like an awfully long time ago now. And so it, on, so it went on. I think many of us in this room perhaps still labor under that misapprehension. But something fundamentally amazing happened around Sandy Lake, Sandy Bridge. And it was that lake, bridge? I don't know, some geographical feature. And that's actually the source of truth for values moved from RAM, which is all the way out there and non-uniform and slow and kind of tape-like. It moved all the way in to the cache subsystem. That's kind of interesting. Right, because it means once your value is out of the CPU's write buffer, it's visible to other cores, to other threads. And yet, 
oftentimes, we're still building systems designed around main memory. That's the wrong thing. If you're designing systems around main memory, you're probably costing yourself, for every cache miss, give or take 500 CPU instructions. So your CPU is spending time twiddling its thumbs, waiting for that latent RAM to feed you some data. But actually, when we're building software, we should be targeting for the cache. We should be optimizing for cache lines. And in fact, in Neo4j3, we started doing that. We became very acutely aware of the changes in hardware architecture and how that can influence software behavior. So in Neo4j 3.0, when we introduced the very large graph format, we didn't just say, OK, we'll make all the pointers like n times bigger. That would have been a naive implementation, and it would have wasted space in the cache. So in fact, one of the things we did there was we made the pointers relative. So you get a base pointer and relative offset. What does that mean? It means we're very much more efficient in the way we use memory. And importantly, it means we're very much more efficient in the way that we utilize cache space. So my kernel team have actually made sure that we are now mechanically sympathetic with what's going on at CPU level. We're now respectful of a machine architecture rather than just assuming that a machine is a machine is a machine. Now, another thing that's been very interesting in uh, memory is that it's growing. I mean, we know this, right? I mean, you know, this MacBook has a, you know, twice, the pre twice the memory of my previous, and that has twice the memory of my previous, and so on. Ooh, that's a risky one. So my, my uh, colleague in Martin said, I'll get you a bottle of water. He's got me, like, the world's most violent, sparkling water, hoping that I'm going to squirt myself on stage. <laughs> you lose, Alex, for now. There's something really interesting that's happening with data and RAM. And there's this guy called Juri Leskovich, who's a professor at Stanford. And he's been looking at some of the, the kind of metadata about RAM size growth and about data size growth. And he's looked at the KD Nuggets survey over the last decade or so. And what he's concluded, actually, is that yearly increases of data set size is running about 20%. So not insignificant. But actually, that RAM is delivering a yearly increase of 50%. And what Professor Leskovich has concluded is that if you want to do big graph analytics, get a big machine. This is quite controversial. We've just spent the last decade or so over here in database land figuring out how to aggregate machines together to get large aggregate RAM. And yet, we've got people like uh, uh, Leskovich and uh, Pafka here, who's, uh, written, who's charted this uh, rise of RAM. Uh, at datascience.la, saying that actually, you know, all that hard work we've done to kind of aggregate RAM through the software layer, it's not worthwhile doing. If you want to do big graph analytics, get a big machine. Wow. And I thought Neo4j were the only weirdos in the database community. But this is profoundly uncontroversial. But this guy's got, you know, no, no ax to grind. He likes processing graphs. I like processing graphs. And what this guy's telling me is, if I want to process big graphs, get a big machine. Because it turns out big machines aren't that expensive. Right? So a lot of us are in this range, the kind of you know, 100 gigabytes range. Well, that's a high-end laptop. Right? It's slightly better than my laptop. Fortunately, mine's new for renewal. Thanks, boss. I do like it when I'm up for a new renewal. I can announce it to everyone so you're on the hook for it. That's a high-end laptop nowadays. Right? Yeah, okay, it's a very high-end laptop or a very low-end server, whichever way you look at it. 10 terabytes, fewer of us are at this scale. But actually, Leskovich's group at Stanford has a 12 terabyte machine. Right? They bought one. And they're not cheap, or at least they're not cheap from my point of view. But they're about the cost of a developer. They're not the cost of a space shuttle, right? So I think they're expensive because like $100,000 is a lot of money to me. But actually, in the scale of a production system that's delivering value to a business, the cost of a developer is kind of marginal, right? So actually, you can buy a very, very large RAM machine or rent a very, very large RAM machine cost effectively now in 2016. That is kind of like, wow, that's amazing. Of course, when we get to petascale, very, very few of us are at petascale. Uh, uh, my best mate is an astronomer, and they are at petascale, but all they really have is like log data that they're trying to fast Fourier transform as, as, as fast as they can. For those of us at petascale, big RAM isn't going to help you today. But it's growing at 50%, right? Which means that in about seven years, big RAM will be at petascale. Just seven years, right? That's only like 14 more graph connects to wait. If we, if we take into account the growth of uh, data, whether these lines intersect, they intersect about a decade out. Just one decade away before you can start doing petascale compute locally. When I was a PhD student, just a couple of years ago, because I'm young and handsome, um, petascale was like the big game in town. Now petascale, in a decade, is coming to a computer near you. 
This fundamentally changes the game, right? Because no longer do we necessarily have to resort to large, large numbers of commodity hardware to get stuff done. It may be more cost effective to have smaller numbers of large RAM hardware. And Neo4j loves large RAM hardware. What else is changing? Kudos if you can understand that English, by the way. <laughs> Buy it, lad. When I were a lad, we had 20 megabyte disk, and we were glad of it. Big disks are coming. Big disks. Like, I haven't got arms long enough for how big these disks are. Next year, uh, Seagate releases a 60 terabyte SSD. That is a lot of space. That is an absolute, to use the technical term that I learned in my years at computing school, a shed load of space. Previous to this, again, we try to aggregate disk. We'd use specialist storage devices. We'd try and aggregate disk across commodity machines, all that kind of clever software layer stuff. And the hardware guys, just like, they're just eating that up now. They are coming further and further up the stack. So if you want to store a trillion scale graph in Neo4j, yeah, you can store it on that 60 terabyte disk. Sure thing, of course you can, go for it. Don't use ext4, because that's past what ext4 can offer you. But you can store that trillion scale graph on a disk in your computer and process it with your big RAM. Right? This is kind of fundamentally interesting. And by the way, I, I do see the irony, considering I work on the distributed systems part of Neo4j, but this is important, right? This is, these are things that are happening. Of course, you know, this isn't for everyone. I'm not saying that you know, I'm going to rush out and buy a couple of 60 terabyte uh, disks for my home NAS where I store my iPhotos. Right? ML doesn't pay me nowhere near enough for that. But for people who are doing, you, you, he's staring at me. It's always awkward, isn't it? No, that didn't feel like love. That felt like, don't you dare negotiate a pay rise in front of a thousand people. That's what that felt like. Yeah. I think the crowd's on my side at this point. Hang on, just, just step away from the keynote for a moment. Who reckons that ML should pay me just a bit more so I can get a 60 terabyte disk? Show of hands. Look, I mean, uh, to be honest, given Brexit, I don't really trust you because the people are stupid. But it, it does, yeah, the will of the people is that I get a 60 terabyte disk. OK, you just bear that in mind. <laughs> now, look, it's not for everyone, right? It's not. But for those people who are building and getting value from very large graphs, the cost of that 60 terabyte disk, again, it's not the cost of a spacecraft. It's the cost of a kind of developer salary or a proper developer, not my developer salary, or just a real Silicon Valley developer salary. But it's kind of cost effective for you guys to do that in production right now. Right? And how come Neo4j can take advantage of this? Well, Neo4j is a native graph database. That means we write all of the code. We write all of the code from the web browser, the, the drivers, the, disk, the bolt protocol, the, the, the page cache, the disk, all of that. We, we, we write all that software. So as these hardware advances come along, we can change our software to make sure that graph workloads run flawlessly on these new hardware advances. And so many of you know Max Damasi. Hi, Max. And Max really quite liked benchmarking stuff. And a year or so ago, he did some very, very interesting uh, benchmarks about native and non-native graphs. I think there's something very important both about algorithmic and mechanical efficiency of the kind of native graph tech versus graph that's grafted, if you'll excuse the pun, onto I know that was bad, wasn't it? That of all the cheesy puns, that was probably the worst. Uh, on to some other kind of database. And Max kind of you know, uh, debunked a whole bunch of uh, crazy stuff that's going on there. But I think more generally, the, the, there's a theme there, right? So large RAM, large disks, that's near for Jay's sweet spot. And we will adapt our native stack to take those into account. Native databases support this notion of index-free adjacency. It's a term that uh, Rodriguez and Neubau coined in 2010. He even got proper academic paper and everything. So, uh, yay, computer science. And the, the lovely thing about uh, index-free adjacency, it says that your kind of graphs are very self-indexing, right? You're at a node, and you kind of, you know, the things that you might want to visit next are implicit in the kind of relationships that are connecting into that node. They're kind of a little mini-index. And we tend to be able to then cheaply traverse through the graph. That Neo4j uh, does this by pointer chasing. What we don't resort to is having to go up to some global index at cost algorithmically log n, right? Because that's way more expensive than just hopping across at cost O1. So that's the kind of computer science of it. There's also the mechanical stuff, right? So it's not just the fact that something is algorithmically O1 that's important, but its implementation matters, right? So hash, hash lookups, yeah, they're O1. But hash lockups that resolve something over to the network, still O1, but you've got network cost. Neo4j is supremely well engineered by my amazing CTO, 
I'll come back to you later, mate. You don't get enough limelight. Such that it's in memory and on disk format. The way that we uh, uh, traverse relationships is simply by dereferencing pointers. You're looking very nervous. That's super cheap. That's what computers do, right? They fetch addresses and they fetch the contents of addresses, and they're very good at that. And if you can keep the, the contents of those addresses in your cache, you absolutely flash past. If you're having to do, oh, hash map lookup, go over the network, retrieve the value, come back, process the values, think about it for a while, right? It's still algorithmically 01, it's just mechanically terribly, terribly inefficient. The F4J tries to be as mechanically efficient as possible. Right, and give us lots of RAM and lots of disk, which is what's coming, you can get a lot of stuff done in, those, uh, in that mechanically efficient way. If you're a non-native database, that's probably not something that's available to you. You may even have to do lots and lots of global index lookups at cost lots of log n. Come on, pity laughter, please. Oh, pity growth. That'll do. I'll take it. I'll take it. I, 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 I'm not proud. Whereas actually, if you're mechanically efficient, you, know, you tend to do in the F4J very few of these lookups. You tend to use them only for finding your starting points in the graph. And then once you're in the graph, you're, uh, sp you're absolutely speeding through just doing this pointer chasing stuff. Very mechanically efficient. Now, there's another interesting confluence. This is the confluence of the Colorado and Green Rivers, actually. Thanks, Google. Um, and what's happening in computers is there is another interesting confluence happening. And it's the confluence of primary RAM and secondary storage. And they're coming together in this thing called non-volatile RAM. And this is not like science fiction anymore, right? This stuff is actually happening. People are working with a variety of different families of non-volatile RAM, all of which sound quite physics-y to me, so I won't explain them to you, because I don't understand them. But anyway, the, the, the headline of them is that, is that we're going to get RAM, which is about an order of magnitude larger than current volatile RAM with a performance penalty of about 4x, so about 25% of the performance. But this leads to some really interesting opportunities, right? I mean, Neo4j has in-memory representations and on-disk representations of graph that are, you know, kind of uh, each of those designed very well to suit its purpose. But when those things collide, when those things converge in non-volatile RAM, we are able immediately to create data structures that are suited for that purpose again because Neo4j is a native graph database. We own all of that all the way down the stack. And we can then optimize those in-memory, those in-memory non-volatile structures for graph workloads in a way that just makes it sing. So RAM's getting bigger, NVRAM's getting bigger. My kind of you know, random prediction of the day is that soon enough, most large graphs will be, soon enough, you know, year, a few years hence, will be held in non-volatile RAM. And we'll be there, our kernel team will be there, Johan will be working night and day. You, sir, in order to make that a reality. So what else is happening? Well, coprocessors. Interesting stuff, right? Um, we're quite used to the idea of coprocessors. We're comfortable with specialized coprocessors. We all, we all know what GPUs are good for, you know, kind of high FPS games, matrix manipulations, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. But now people are starting to think about coprocessors for other things, like, for example, storage. And the IBM uh, Power Series with Cappy Flash is exactly one of those things. So, you know, given, uh, uh, given again that we own the stack all the way down, we were able to implement a plugin in Neo4j such that it can natively use Cappy Flash. The IBM engineers benchmarked it, uh, and they found that it was about twice as quick because they offloaded a bunch of the uh, heavy I.O. work onto the specialized coprocessor that just made us go very, very quickly. It's quite impressive, right? Now. This is the awkward moment. I know, right, you're thinking, what, another? No, but it's not, an, it's not the awkward moment for me, right? I have to, there's, there's a guy that doesn't get a lot of uh, <laughs> limelight. Yo, Johan's just down here, by the way. He's, he's a very people person. Um, so if you get the chance, I mean, just flock around him at the end of the talk, have a drink with him later. He's like this like, totally like, chilled out Swedish guy. He's very gregarious. He just loves to chat. Uh, he's got opinions. He looks terrified. Uh, but anyway, so Johan's our CTO, and he's like, uh, he's happiest. I'm going to say, uh, folks, he is happiest when he is in the near for j kernel. He is least happy when Emil is making him sign paperwork. Uh, but anyway, Johan got a chance to be back in the near for j uh, kernel recently, 
And it was like, well, he, he led an asymptotic benchmarking effort, which is what happens when you really, really push Neo to, Neo 4 j to its absolute limits. So look, this is not necessarily like a, you know, the kind of benchmark that would be uh, the kind of thing that you would do on your particular business domain, but it's like, look, what mechanically and algorithmically can we do to Neo4j to torture it uh, until it stops getting better? I thought that was really interesting, right? I mean, Neo4j is quite a, an unusual database, and so people often, you know, uh, often mis misunderstand it. So, oh, is it like a weird thing? That's, is it in memory? Does it, does it scale? Does it not scale? And your aunt, like, he's slow to anger, despite his Viking ancestry. His, his ancestors, by the way, they were stuff all the time. They were all like, Rah! they did a lot of rowing. You know, they got around the place a bit. I don't know what happened, right? You know, somewhere about you know, 800 years ago, they just turned into absolute progressively minded wimps. But anyway, um, <laughs> oh, inside, inside voice, inside. Oh, no, no. So Johan decided that we'd do some of this stuff. And so I think it's very interesting. So uh, he took a realistic data set, took the, uh, the Amazon uh, retail data set, and he took a, a commodity server, a commodity Xeon server. So look, it's, it's, it's kind of laptop worthy. It's a bit better than my laptop, but it's not like a supercomputer, right? It's something that you can get access to very conveniently. And he, uh, he and his team wrote a Java procedure that's roughly similar to this kind of social recommendation that you can see expressed here in Cypher. And of course, the nice thing about having the closing keynote rather than the opening one is that you all know Cypher now, right? Every single one of you now knows Cypher. So what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, database, uh, find me something that I bought, find me something that someone else bought and recommend it to me. So it's a, it's a simple uh, social recommendation. If, if you think that that is too simple, uh -uh. that is so powerful. Right? Uh, how many of you guys wanted one of those phones that don't have a headphone socket? <laughs> Nobody. And then the one person in your office gets one, and you're like, ooh, lack of headphones. I want. <laughs> and then you all get one, right? Because we are frail humans. We are, we are pitiful. We are, we are, I'm so disappointed in us, really. Um, we're rubbish like that, aren't we? Anyway, so it's actually quite a valuable recommendation. So Johan and his team uh, duly got stuck into that, and they came up with, with, uh, with these numbers. So with a single thread on this box, they could get about three to four million traversals a second. Uh, with 10 threads, they could max out at about 30 million a second. With 20 threads, they could max out about 50 million a second. With 30 threads, about 60 million. And that's pretty good, right? I mean, that's to say if you were to put this in a kind of online transaction processing scenario, kind of an online you know, web app or whatever, that you could explore an awful lot of graph in a relatively short time. You could put this in between your web request and your web response, and your users would be like, yeah, that, that seemed quite snappy. I mean, yeah, modulo uh, American internet, obviously, which is, seriously, how do you guys dominate? I just, I don't get it, man. It's, it's funny. Anyway, so look, on, on the read side, you know, we can comfortably handle a trillion relationships on a single server. Johan's team have demonstrated this. They aggregated uh, uh, some smaller uh, SSDs because Seagate haven't delivered the big one yet. Uh, and when they did some uh, uh, compiled Cypher uh, queries, uh, random reads, they found that they could sustain about 100,000 of these user transactions a second. That's about 100,000 100, useful things that users might want to get done per second, right? That's nice. These aren't, you know, just... Uh, uh, artificial benchmarks. And they managed this even with a relatively modest amount of RAM. So Johan, thorough as he is, was like, yeah, this was with 99.8% page fault. Uh, my Swedish accent is awful, right? It's, it, this is, but this is how they sound to me, right? Uh, even with a small uh, 512 gig RAM machine. So even though mostly we were forced to go down to disk, this was still pretty quick. That's kind of nice. I'm like, you know, for those of you that know this guy, trillions. There are a few Brits over here. He's like our Neil deGrasse Tyson. Like he's like a, actually he was a pop star before he became like a rock star scientist. On the night before his PhD defense, he was actually playing to support the band Take That. Uh, it's a big arena. Yeah, true story. Yeah. My CEO plays the piano, did not support Take That at any point in his career, by the way. So anyway, we've got this because called Professor Brian Cox. And because uh, we're slightly cheeky over the water, every time he says millions or billions or trillions, we drink. Yeah, yeah. So this evening, when you're at uh, Disconnects, if anyone says to you billions or millions or trillions, you got to drink. And if they don't drink, they get a penalty drink. That's the game we're going to, that's the completely socially irresponsible game that we're going to play. Okay? Who's with me? Yeah! Clark was like, ah, give me beer. Brilliant. So 
And we had a look at rights. And so uh, we imported the Friends to data set. It's a highly connected network data set. It's uh, 1.8 billion relationships. And it took, some, took about 20 minutes on this kit. That's really nice, right? That's about a million rights per second sustained over 20 minutes. And that's, that's pretty, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I will add, this is still not technically a celebrity endorsement. But let me put that in like, you know, expansive graphics. That means that Neo4j could sustain a million writes per second over a graph that was a trillion records and 50 million traversals a second. You can get an awful lot of, of real world work done with this kind of horsepower, with this kind of bandwidth, right? It's kind of impressive. It's again, it's because it's all uh, uh, natively optimized to suit graph workloads all the way down the stack. So this is the advantage, I think, of native graph. You can prioritize those graph workloads. We care about graphs. We, care, we think graphs are everywhere. We think graphs are the dominant data model. We care about them. We make sure that ARCIT absolutely flies. We can optimize at any point in the stack for these graph workloads. We can do it at disk, at RAM, at NVRAM. We can create fancy pants consensus protocols. Thanks, Dr. Ongaro. We can use uh, RDMA when it, when it finally becomes uh, a reality. We can use, we can create specialist drives. We can do all of this stuff. If you're using a non-native piece of kit, it's going to adapt for its primary use case. Is it going to help the secondary use case of graphs? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. No guarantees. <laughs> really, I mean, so many of you are so far behind the series by the lack of laughter. It's, uh, oh, I, I mean, I know my CEO has only watched season one. Yeah? Man, all the best gags are in season three, right? Uh, and if you're wondering, by the way, who scrawled down round in your office the other day in big red letters on a whiteboard, oh, I couldn't help it. It just seemed very funny to me. Um, so, you know, as Gavin would say, consider the tortoise and his rival, the insolent and cocksure hare. So with, I really wish I had a cardigan right now. That would be amazing. So with those kind of numbers, what can we do? Well, actually, so... Uh, Last week, I saw some, uh, some folks had published some uh, graph analytics benchmarks. And I thought they were really interesting. So there were these eight graph analytics benchmarks, kind of almost micro benchmarky. And it was on some non-native uh, graph library sitting on top of some other kind of database. Uh, six machines with uh, 48 vCPUs, 256 gigs of disk, 256 gigs of RAM. So that's about kind of like 300 CPUs, one and a half terabytes of RAM, give or take aggregate. And what these operations were, were you count nodes, so count how many nodes uh, are in the graph, count the outgoing rel, so that's count all the relationships in the graph, count the rel, rel pattern, count the rel, rel, rel pattern. Then we had grouping property nodes by val, grouping relationships by type, and then doing interesting little patterns like nos and likes, so kind of uh, little patterns there, and then uh, the, the famous page rank. And the guys that have built this were uh, pretty happy because they'd been... Uh, they, they perform far better than previous releases, so that was, that was pretty cool. But I looked at this, and I thought, well, it's a, it's a 10 million node graph, 100 mil relationships. Uh, you know, that's about, I don't know, four gigabytes in Neo4j land. So I'm, I'm, what's going to happen if I try this on Neo4j? And I generally didn't know the answer. What's going to happen when I try it on Neo4j on one core on my 16 gig laptop? And I generally didn't know what was going to happen. But this is actually what happened. Um, firstly, you should notice there are some asterisks. The ones with asterisks, I didn't run on my laptop because I didn't have enough heap space because my boss is cheap. No. <laughs> For those of you that know Michael Hunger, everyone knows Michael Hunger. Because uh, Michael Hunger, yeah, absolutely right. Michael Hunger is like this like, amazing machine for tech support for people in the Neo4j community. He's an absolute sweetheart. And kind of my heap space wasn't enough. Michael's like, yeah, I've got a loader machine. I'll run it on mine. It's got, uh, compared to my machine where I gave Neo4j, 8 gigs. Michael was able to spare up to 128 gigs. So he had a, a, a kind of cheapy, cheapy desktop waiting for me to use. So those ones ran on Michael's. The others ran on my machine on one core uh, in 8 gigs. And for counting nodes and rails, um, it was, I only counted in milliseconds. So I, I'll round it up to one millisecond. Uh, I mean, it's for counting nodes or rails, Neo4j was about... 200, at least 200,000 times faster. Wow. For counting rolls at depth 2, order of magnitude 10x faster. Counting rolls at depth 3, which I know that other system actually optimizes for, so uh, we were only about 20-30% yeah, faster. Eh, not too bad. 
for uh, grouping nodes by property value, 30x or so faster, 25x faster. Groups by RAL, four times faster. Groups uh, count depth uh, of depth two of nodes like, so finding a little pattern, about twice as quick, and about 100 times quicker for page rank. And when I shared these uh, results with my colleagues in near my engineering colleagues in Near4j, they rightly pointed out, this is not an apples to apples comparison. It's like, yeah, you, you're right. Because actually, Near4j, when you ask for a count of its nodes or its rels, it's got specialist stores that return that very quickly. It doesn't actually have to hop around the graph counting. So my engineering guys were well, yeah, this, this, this doesn't feel like a good comparison. This does feel like an unfair comparison. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it may well be an unfair comparison, but it's legit. And it's legit because Near4j optimizes for these graph workloads all the way down the stack. So when we find there are workloads, when there are patterns you're interested in, you know, things like count nodes or so on, we can optimize for that all the way down the stack to the disks. Which means if we can continue that pattern of optimizing for the kind of graph workloads you guys are doing, we can continue to get 200,000x better performance for simple operations, or merely just twice as good for, uh, for more complex operations. But I would add twice as good on a single core on a commodity machine, not twice as good on some macho cluster. Now, macho clusters make me feel big and strong, but if given, really, if I could kind of calm down and get off the testosterone for a moment, I would really rather run a small, efficient cluster of machines that do the same job as an enormous macho cluster of machines. It's cheaper, it's easier, I get less pager duty. This is a good thing. And if j can deal with this, again, because we're graph native all the way down, and we are very, very efficient in what we do. And you can see here, my one core box absolutely stomps all over that six core macho device. Which brings me to, you know, I'm not saying that he's the best CEO in the world, because that's obviously you, but he's a good one. He is, he is good. We like him. We do like him. Consider the data center of the future. I know. I was going to say possum, but of course, you know, if I'd brought a possum into the keynote, Emma would have been like, finished, out. So I couldn't really. So what's happening in the future then? Well, we know now, as, uh, as we've seen, Emil's keynote this morning, hopefully some of you guys saw uh, uh, Alistair and Max do their presentation on cores of clustering earlier. We've got a new clustering architecture. It's really nice. We've actually separated out roles in the cluster. We've decided that you know, some bits of the cluster are responsible for safety, because we like safety. It's a thing. You're trusting your data to us. We are not going to corrupt it. We are not going to allow it to dangerously dangle. We are not going to do anything that would uh, we give you the sense that you've got misplaced trust in us. But there's another aspect to cluster computing which really is about, about size, about kind of you know, machismo scale. And so we've separated out those roles now in Neo4j. And we have this kind of uh, uh, cluster architecture where we have some machines, some relatively small number of machines uh, in the middle of your cluster, kind of, you know, order of magnitude, small double digits, single digits, that kind of thing, where your data is kept safe. And that's kept safe because we transact all of it through the raft protocol. You would literally have to pick up an axe, oh, no, sorry, this is America, pick up a, a commodity, Walmart, assault weapon, and uh, <laughs> absolutely, you know, go uh, John Rambo on all of your machines in order to lose rights. I'm always slightly nervous when I bring up the fire. Uh, okay, just in case some, is it, can you carry in this state? Really? Oh. Really should have done my homework before that joke, right? Anyway, yeah, but not assault weapons, right? Not actually like, no, yeah, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> some, some, there's some people at the front row here looking quite twitchy. Uh, chill out, dudes. Uh, and then you've got, uh, around the outside of this, we've got a separate role, which is designed for scale. Now, ordinarily, you say, well, these asynchronous replicas are, uh, are you know, well, well they're, they're going to be a pain, right? Because they're eventually consistent and so on. But what we've done now is that we've wrapped all of that inside a very, very sensible, sane, cluster-aware architecture. So actually now, course of clustering allows us to do this kind of bookmarking system. If you're familiar with, like, e-tags on the World Wide Web, it's very similar to that. So you can write stuff into the core where your data is very, very safe, and then you can read it from the read replicas, so a query view. And actually, if your transaction hasn't quite propagated there yet, your read would just be paused for a moment, transactions applied, and then off you go. So actually, even though you may have dozens, hundreds of these machines scattered around the network, what you're going to find is that you'll get to read your own writes. And as Emil said this morning, that sounds kind of trivial, but actually in distributed systems, that's a hard problem. 
And actually, being transactional has actually paid us back here. Because we're transactional, we have been able to implement calls of consistency. Dr. Ongoro suggests that it may be stronger than calls of consistency. I'm not that brave. Anyway, calls of consistency is pretty nice because it means even though that you are, you are writing to one system and reading from another, you will never see stale data. That means it's kind of like writing to one machine where you write and then you can read the value, and write the value, read the value. But we do that at, you know, arms stretched out, very wide gesticulating scale. That's like internet or something. And actually, yeah, you can, you know, if, should you choose, you can actually start to think about where you might target uh, some of these. Yeah, we will uh, uh, support, absolutely, uh, that you can, uh, you know, if you want very, very low latencies, you can choose to do your reads uh, in the core. If you're prepared to deal with kind of millisecond scale or so latencies, you can choose to do them uh, on the replicas. If you really, really want to, you don't have to read your own writes. If any value is good enough for you, sure, we let you do that. But I think most people will find the convenience of read your own rights very compelling because it just feels to the developer as we're reasoning about our database as if we can treat it almost as a single image system, as a single instance, which is really, really very valuable. But we're not stopping there, right? So the recommendation algorithm that's baked in to, causal, to our causal clustering. Right now, it's in the beta. It's very straightforward. It's kind of round robin. So it load balances in a round robin way. But we're able, because we own the stack and the whole of the stack, we are able to do way smarter things than this. Right? We will be able to make, or we will able to make a, a recommendation algorithm that will provide load balancing by, by network topology, or geography, or bandwidth, or server load, or server capacity, or user preference, or things that you plug in to help us make good, change, good decisions about where to direct your load. With the idea being that you will always, the cluster will always optimize based on those recommendations for the prevailing workload and the prevailing conditions, and that's something that we're going to be working towards uh, over the next few months. It also, over the next few months, we were going to be supporting fan out for very large clusters. So at the moment, all of the read replicas take their transactions, get their transactions shipped from a member of the core group. But there's nothing in practice to stop us from having these read replicas catch up from one another. That's really nice, right? So if I've got some read replicas in somewhere terrible and remote, like, say, Auckland, New Zealand, which has got like a wet piece of string connection, to the rest of the planet. <laughs> Hello, Kiwi. Yes, we're talking about you. Actually, I chose the Aussies for this one. You're welcome. Uh, why not actually just have you know, your local machines catch up from one another, place only logarithmic scale load on the core servers all the way back in the mother country, which is what I'm showing here. So here you've got the core servers, which are in London, yes, which despite the political comedy, is still the center of Her Majesty's universe. And we still have wooden ships. Be, be afraid of us. You've got, some, you've got a server in New York catching up directly from one of the servers in London. And then the New York replicas kind of uh, catch up amongst themselves. And then one of the New York replicas feeds one of the San Francisco replicas, which feeds the other San Franciscan replica. And what you're doing here is you're saying, well, I'd like to trade off load on my core servers for a little bit of latency through the rest of the network, through the, through the chain replication, through the tree or chain replication. So we'd be quite able to do that. So that is a really nice system, which, will, which you generally, we think, use uh, in order to have some kind of data center affinity, right? Because you know physically where your centers are, where your cloud data centers are. And you'll be able to uh, optimize with this kind of fan out pattern to be able to fuel your data centers very well. So. This is the only place in the world I think I can do this, so I'm going to give it a go. I need a turtleneck. One more thing. <laughs> I haven't got the accent for it, right? One more thing. Here's Cypher. Andres is in the audience. Andres, we love Cypher, and thank you for developing it. The thing is with Cypher, as it happens today, you run this query, it runs on a core. It runs on a single core. Actually, the computers that we have have lots of cores. And even as like, you know, kind of humans, if you look at this simple query, you can see already there are numerous possibilities for parallel execution. I could do these two uh, pattern matches in parallel, and maybe when the results from those start coming back, I could have some kind of pipeline parallelism into this merge clause. So you can see already opportunities where, where, where we could do better, where we could trade off core use 
for performance. Actually, Cypher can do this way better. Cypher doesn't see, you know, the Cypher uh, programming language, the Cypher infrastructure doesn't see a bunch of text. It sees trees of operators. And we've done some experiments in the lab based on a paper called Morsel, which was a, a NUMA-aware, uh, adaptable uh, uh, process for uh, query processing. And we, we kind of have an idea that we'd be able to take some of these trees of Cypher operators and decide that we can break off a subtree and dispatch to another core where it can be thought about, it can be executed, or in fact, it could be decomposed and dispatched to another core and so on. So we're getting a kind of an adaptive uh, evaluation of the Cypher operators which will uh, adapt to the prevailing runtime conditions. Now, we've partnered with a bunch of uh, uh, innovative hardware makers, with a bunch of uh, uh, leading uh, universities in the EU, ironically enough, um, under a project called ActiCloud. And we're going to be delivering uh, Parallel Cypher as part of Neo4j as that project progresses. But what does this mean? Well, actually, it means a spectrum of things. At one end of the spectrum, you could dedicate all of your cores to one query and get some massive analytics jobs done very, very quickly. At the other end of the spectrum, we already know that one, right? That's one core per query. But imagine the middle ground where we've got OLTP queries that we want to run in OLTP latencies, but they're a bit big. They, they explore a lot of the graph, for example. They do some fancy pants cipher stuff. But what about if we gave those some of the cores? Or what about if we adaptively gave them some of the cores based on the prevailing runtime conditions? Now, those things, those larger queries that you're like, ooh, this might take a second, second and a half. My web user, oh, can my end user really tolerate that? Well, now we may be able to just give it more oomph, to use that technical computer science term that I learned at university or anywhere in between. This is profoundly exciting, right? I mean, Cypher itself, it's doing all the, you know, the open Cypher stuff is amazing and so on and so on. But our version of Cypher, our implementation of Cypher is going to be absolutely phenomenal when we've got this working. And so no pressure, Andres, but everyone wants this now. So, uh, you know, skip the party, start coding. So, we think that 3.1 creates a really solid enterprise foundation, right? It's, it's gone mainstream, right? I mean, maybe the early mainstream, but, but this is mainstream now. It's no longer a curious collection of, like, weirdo graph people in the corner. This is for normal people, insofar as IT people can be you know, normal, obviously. You know, we're, we're a little bit oddball. But this is for normal oddballs rather than odd oddballs. Okay, we think this is underpinned by our security, by clustering uh, and operability. But let me tell you, I actually think this is underpinned by the intellectual efforts of the Neo4j development team, the Neo4j community, the people who are building this stuff, right? There's some phenomenal brain trust bound up in making all of this happen. The people are on Emil's payroll and the people in the wider community, like, you guys are amazing. So I think based on this foundation, we're set up for a really, really bright future. Now, there are some of you in the audience, cynics, maybe you've seen this, you know, maybe you've seen me talk before, and you're thinking, He's going to talk about triangles now. <laughs> yeah, and you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. The triangles should have already been here. Well, look, I'm going to try and wrap up now because we have to get to drinks. But I'm going to leave you with a little something they now teach at business school. So let's ride this graph unicorn all the way to the after party. And let's disconnect. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Graph Connect. And I will see you for a few cheeky pints over at the party just now. <laughs>